The law of consecration and stewardship is the gospel plan of economics. More specifically, it is the law of economics associated with the Melchizedek priesthood. It has its basis in the covenant of consecration, which is one of the sacred covenants of the Melchizedek priesthood. The law of consecration is founded in the idea that man can become an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. In order to become an heir of God, the prophet Joseph Smith explained, all men who become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ will have to receive the fullness of the ordinances of his kingdom, and those who will not receive all the ordinances will come short of the fullness of that glory if they do not lose the whole of it. Now, the fullness of the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood, these are administered in the house of the Lord. And in that sense, then, the law of consecration has its basis in sacred covenants and responsibilities of the house of the Lord. The prophet Joseph Smith explained the need to consecrate in order to attain status as an heir. In writing to the brethren in Jackson County, Missouri, he said this, The fact is that a man is bound by the law of the Church to consecrate to the bishop before he can be considered a legal heir to the kingdom of Zion. Now the issue then is what are the rights of heirship? To be an heir is to inherit jointly that which uh, our Father in heaven possesses. Some people have the idea that the law of consecration is a poverty-oriented program. But think of it this way. What would you give to be a joint heir with a billionaire? What would you give to have a checkbook as big as his and to have equal rights in an economic system with him? The law of consecration is, by, is founded on this sacred principle of heirship. And to be specific, a person who is an heir has the right, first of all, to be a steward over a portion of the common property, and to manage that stewardship freely. Secondly, he has a right equal with other heirs in the system to draw upon the storehouse in order to uh, operate and to expand his stewardship. Now, the Lord has said in section 42, uh, or stated rather right in section 42, the, the basic principle pertaining to consecration. Here, beginning with verse 30, he says this, Thou wilt remember the poor, and consecrate of thy properties for their support, that which thou hast to impart unto them of a covenant and a deed which cannot be broken. And inasmuch as ye impart of your substance unto the poor, ye will do it unto me, and they shall be laid before the bishop of my church and uh, his counselors. Uh, this same law is expressed in the Book of Mormon. For example, as uh, Alma, after baptizing the people at the waters of Mormon, uh, organized them, he also gave to them the law of consecration. Here in Alma, rather, Mosiah chapter 18, we read as follows. And again, Alma commanded that the people of the church should impart of their substance. Every one according to that which he had, if he uh, had more abundantly, he should impart more abundantly. And of him that had but little, but little should be required, and to him that had uh, not should be given. And thus they should impart of their substance, of their own free will and good desires, towards God, to those uh, priests that stood in need, yea, and to every needy, naked soul. Now, this same principle was applied and carried out later uh, with this identical group of people. We find uh, recorded, for example, in Alma chapter 1, this statement of the giving report of their activities. And they did impart of their substance every man according to that which he had, to the poor and the needy, and the sick and the afflicted, and they did not wear costly apparel, yet they were neat and comely, and thus they did establish the affairs of the church. Now, uh, in viewing this program, let's first of all note that a person having consecrated and thereby become an heir, has the right to be a steward, and that stewardship is to be delegated to him according to the principles of common consent. For example, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote to the brethren in the early days of the church about 
the expression of this principle, and said, The matter of consecration must be done by the mutual consent of both parties. For to give the bishop power to say how much every man shall have, and he be obliged to comply with the uh, bishop's judgment, is giving to the bishop more power than the king has. And upon the other hand, to let every man say how much he needs, and the bishop be obliged to comply with his judgment, is to throw Zion into confusion. He then goes on to show that there must be a balance or equilibrium of power between the bishop and the steward, and that in this program mutual consent and consideration should be given. But in the event that the bishop and the uh, prospective steward cannot come to a mutual agreement, then the decision is not to be made either by the bishop or by the steward, but rather instead by an independent body of twelve high priests, presumably the High Council, since this statement was written before the High Council was organized. Now, when the person has received his stewardship, he then is a free agent and a responsible agent in the management of his stewardship. And uh, here, in explaining this phase of the program, the Lord has said in section 42 of the Doctrine and Covenants, Thou shalt stand in the place of thy stewardship. In other words, be a responsible agent. Thou shalt not take thy brother's garment. Thou shalt pay for that which thou hast received, or thou receivest of thy brother. Uh, this gives us to understand that uh, the individual is a free and a responsible agent in the management of his stewardship, that when he produces that which his stewardship is designed to produce, he sells it on the open market, and he receives the price for his produce according to the operation of the open market. And if a person, even a fellow steward, desires something of uh, his brother, he is to pay for it. Now, this then is the basic program. This is a very individualistic program. It's probably the most individualistic economic order known to man. On the other hand, it is a system founded in union that kind of union that is made possible by the influence of the Holy Spirit, so that the uh, principle is founded upon ideal, ideal individualism uh, associated then with, with social union and with brotherhood made possible by the gospel plan. Now, a person then, as we've said, who is an heir of God, has a right to be a steward over a portion of the consecrated property. The second right that he has is the right to draw upon the storehouse equal with other stewards in order to manage and to expand his stewardship. Now, the storehouse plays a very important role in this system. Uh, it may be conceived of being something like a bank. It's not merely a great storage center, but it's something like a bank in that it is uh, the economic center of that particular community. And uh, in this respect, then, it's at the very heart and at the very pulse, then, of the whole economic program. Now, it's necessary that there be a uh, surplus in the storehouse, and surplus uh, accrues in the storehouse on two principles. First of all, uh, surplus consecration. It's not a correct principle for a bishop to delegate out all that he has received in in the form of consecration. He must have something left over as a residue, to use the Lord's uh, terminology, so that you have a, a, a basis of operation. You have surplus in the storehouse upon which the system then can operate. Now, the second means by which you acquire surplus in the storehouse is through surplus production. The Lord has told us in both section 70 and section 78 of the Doctrine and Covenants that the saints are to be equal that we're to have an equal standard of living. Uh, and this then, according to our families and the situation then of a particular family. But uh, having achieved then this standard of equality, then all else that a steward produces through the management of his stewardship is turned over to the storehouse in the form of surplus production. And this is what we mean, then, by surplus production. Now, there is, then, a surplus, and each steward in the, the uh, system has an equal right with every other steward to draw upon that particular uh, 
surplus in order to manage the concerns of his stewardship. For example, if we keep from uh, the stewardship that we have, that which is necessary to sustain our family, according to a particular standard that has been agreed upon and mutually consented to, and then we turn all else over to the storehouse, then the question may be asked, what do we operate our stewardship on the next year? And the answer is, but that which you keep out for your family, you use for family purposes. When you come to give an account of your stewardship at the end of each year, you merely designate that you've kept out that which is appropriate uh, to uh, uh, enable your family to live on an equal standard with other families. The bishop doesn't ask you how you spend that. This is none of his business, frankly speaking. You can spend it on whatever you would like to spend it on. You can buy some dash on poodles or have wall-to-wall -wall carpet and back-to-the-wall finances, or you can put it on a down payment on a Cadillac or something else, or you can save it and spend a little on recreation or something like this. But you keep out that which is appropriate to a given standard that is mutually agreed upon by the community. And then you turn all else over, and it's this money that's turned into the storehouse that becomes an operating fund. And uh, of the fact that men have, who are stewards have equal right upon this, this fact is very well expressed in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants. For example, in section 82, uh, the Lord has made this clarification. He says, and you, you are to be equal, or in other words, you are to have equal claims on the properties for the benefit of managing the concerns of your stewardship. Note this is a, a fund for the management of stewardship. It's not a fund to be drawn on primarily uh, to take care of your family. It's a, a common operating fund to be used in the management of stewardship. He says you would have equal claim then on the property for the benefit of managing the concerns of your stewardship, every man according to his wants and needs, inasmuch as his wants and needs are just. And he goes on to say that this then, that every man may improve upon his talent, and the word talent means financial holdings, that every man may acquire further uh, financial holdings. Probably the classic statement on this is over in uh, section 104 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Beginning with verse 68, the Lord there instructs the brethren to turn into the storehouse as fast as they receive money, that would say receive uh, uh, from their stewardships. And then he indicates that uh, when this is turned into the storehouse, it's not to be considered the private account of any individual. It's turned in and becomes the common property of the whole group. And this is what it means to have all things in common. We have an individual stewardship, and then we establish a common fund to which we as heirs have equal right to draw upon it for the benefit of our stewardship. And he says, uh, uh, as he speaks of this, uh, uh, let not any among you say that it is his own, for it shall not be called his nor any part of it. And there shall not any part of it be used or taken out of the storehouse only according to the common needs of the, of the individual and by common consent. And then he tells us how this is done, and that is that I mutually consent to another steward taking out that which he would like, and he mutually consents to me doing this. Now, this is the kind of program that was established in the Book of Mormon. For example, here in uh, now, Alma chapter 1, where we quoted uh, the previous statement concerning it being established, they speak of the great benefits of this particular program. And uh, beginning with verse 29 and 30, uh, the uh, record has this then to say concerning uh, the benefits of that program. And now, because of the studies in the church, they began to be exceedingly rich, having abundance of all things whatsoever they stood in need. And then it concludes with this statement in verse 31, And thus they did prosper and become far more wealthy than those who did not belong to their church. Finally, over in 4th Nephi, as we speak of the great benefits of this system as it was established among the Nephites after Christ's coming, we have this statement. It came to pass through the thirty and sixth year, the people were all converted unto the Lord. 
uh, upon the face of the land, both Nephites and Lamanites. And there were no contentions and disputations among them, and every man did deal justly one with another, and they had all things common among them. Therefore there were no rich and poor, bond or free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. This, then, is the great plan to introduce man into that divine economic order where he can become an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ and share equally in these great blessings economically and spiritually in the building of the kingdom. May the Lord bless us to see and appreciate this, I humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen.